The internet, yes. I know, the internet never messes up, does it? All right, guys, we are ready to start. Rock and roll. Please have a seat, Patrick. <laughs> yes, sir. My name is Tim Albright. I am from AV Nation. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we're doing a live stream uh, on our website, uh, avnation.tv. Uh, we also have a great audience here at the Layard Plain Arts offices in New York City for New York Digital Signage Week. We're going to go down the line here, have everybody introduce themselves, but thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be talking about the uh, uh, digital canvas and uh, some interesting things that creatives and designers and actually end users uh, can, can use uh, the new uh, technology for. So first and foremost, David, uh, your name and where you're from. Hey there, David Biancharty with AVNC. We're a uh, creative uh, design and technology studio here in New York. We call ourselves an experience design studio. We design and build software-driven uh, physical environments with digital layers in architectural spaces, museums, things like that. Okay, Michael. Hey, I'm uh, Michael Lux Schneider. I am the creative technology director um, for the digital experience design group that's sitting within Gensler. Um, Gensler being the world's largest architectural design firm. Within it, we have a, a team that really focuses on how we bring uh, digital activations into the built environment, and I oversee how we implement and leverage technology to do that. Yeah. Hey. My name is Abe Pierre. I'm the America's team leader for Bloomberg LP. We touch more the training, flex, multi-purpose conference rooms, but we also have a big piece in the digital um, signage um, environment for our spaces when it comes to public area displays and what we're bringing to their end users on their mobile phones, um, desktops, et cetera. Yeah, right, everyone. Okay. Uh, James Fife, I'm with uh, RP Visual Solutions. I'm their consultant extension. And RP Visuals is, for lack of a better term, the glue that holds the displays into the building and lets the building breathe and not affect any of the displays and make sure it's going to last for a long time and look good. So, very good. Sam? Hi, I'm Sam Phoenix. I'm the Vice President of Research and Development for Planar Liard, which hopefully you guys all know who we are since you're here <laughs> at our showroom. You're Welcome. In space. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aran Sharon. I lead uh, the this digital, design, digital experience design practice at TAD. TAD is a technology consulting firm here in New York City. We focus on enterprise workplace and uh, try to look at a more experiential environment in terms of how we see people living, working, and engaging with the workplace. All right, David, we'll start with you on this. Um, we, we talk about content today, and you can walk through Times Square and you can see something that, again, this is a little subjective, but really great content and really content that wasn't necessarily made for the display. So when you think about content today, what, what is it that you're, that you're talking about? So we've been talking about uh, something in, in terms of sort of deep media. Um, okay. If we think of all the typical um, displays that we see in the world that are 99% historically have been fed with uh, linear media play out, right? So produced videos that have been put in the can, played, made into a playlist, uh, and sequenced into some curated playlist for the audience in the place that we are and with the stories that we're trying to tell. When we try to scale that, or we try to do something interesting that's a non-typical canvas or that has insane pixel resolutions, et cetera, you start to run out of steam on that strategy of filling them with pre-produced linear media. Either it's going to go stale too fast, or it's going to cost too much to produce, or it's not going to be relevant when you want audiences to pay attention. So we start to think about data as material that can be used for storytelling that's really content. Um, all the ways in which um, libraries of images and other things that the brand already has in place how do they get recomposited and leveraged into uh, dynamic media? So it's about media that can be uh, essentially generated in real time, algorithmically, um, and combine that with some moments of pre-produced media so that you actually have something that's living and breathing, responding to the environment, responding to the curator, um, and uh, doesn't mean you have to call the agency every five minutes and, and uh, spin up another you know, 10 minutes of uh, 80, uh, you know, megapixel video yeah. in some cases. Abe, is that something that you guys that you look at, and, and that is that a concern of yours? Absolutely. Um, for Bloomberg, what we've done is we've been able to take exactly what um, 
we're speaking about now when it comes to that deep media, that deep content, and give it to the end users where they are. So uh, we have a lot of different screen sizes all over our environment, right? So we have a traditional LCD panel that's 55 inches in a conference room. Then we have our, our lobby area that has, you know, uh, a, a, a 32.9 side-by-side LG 88 stretch inch that also has its own particular media. But then we go over to our EMEA offices and APAC offices, we have different digital signage pieces there too, but we need to deliver the same type of content to all those pieces because Bloomberg likes to be Bloomberg wherever they are. Um, and to that point is what we've decided with, with our, our creative team, the marketing team, is to create content uh, or create the story and let the display kind of evolve into itself. So. Our creative team has decided to push content or push the content that's most important to Bloomberg, which is its philanthropy work. So in all of our conference rooms, in training room spaces, once those machines go to sleep for 10 minutes, a screensaver comes on. Instead of having something traditional, it's all of the philanthropy work that Bloomberg's been working on for that quarter, for that month. And it's frequently updated um, per whatever's happening in, in the philanthropy space. Another cool part that we've decided to incorporate within the internal office communications is our, what we call Bloomberg Arcade, where it's local content to that specific office. So if you're in New York, you have New York content. If you're in Princeton, you have Princeton content. If you're in London, you have London specific content. And that content is, again, a, derived around what's happening in that office. So whether you're at your desktop and it's a smaller size screen, a smaller window on your desktop, you're ingesting that content for your site. Or if you're in the pantry area, it's on a, a massive LED planar layered wall there that also is giving you that same content. So whichever Bloomberg space you're in, you're gonna get the, you're gonna get a similar feel of content, but it's gonna be content specific to who you are and what you're ingesting. Mm -hmm. The same I want to bring you in on something that David said about the deep media and the data-driven stories. When you're looking and, and you're talking with folks like David and like Iran and even you know the end-to-end -end users, you know, where are you guys when it comes to making sure that, that what these guys are, are coming up with is, are able, is able to be displayed, you know, you know, I guess properly is the best way, to, but, but it, with their original vision in mind? Thanks. So um, I think... You know, one of the interesting things that we've been talking about is this digital canvas. And traditionally, um, you know, it was 16.9, it was rectangular. Um, with LED, because people tend to fill a space, um, and it also has options where you can have, like, curved screens, flexible screens, all kinds of shapes and sizes, um, and, and very large as well. It allows you to um, really think about the experience and think about how you can make it more of an immersive Thing. like people can almost like lose themselves in the content in a way that you can't really do when you just have this little rectangle. Um, so the important things for for um, for us as we're thinking about developing products is trying to make them as flexible as possible. And I don't mean just literally flexible, but also like making sure that we you know stay up on all the standards so that whatever type of source content that you have, we have a way to get it on the wall. Um, but also experimenting with different display technologies like the transparent OLED. I mean, it just opens up a huge amount of possibilities for what you can do with that. I've seen some really interesting concepts where people have, have layered it and put LCD or LED behind it, so it creates almost like a, a 3D effect. So one of the fun things about my job, like we design products and we're engineers, we're geeks, and we're not nearly as creative as the people who come up with these experiences, and it's really fun for my team when we get to see the case studies and we get to see the images of what of what people have done with these building blocks that we've provided. Yeah, absolutely. Real quickly, can you define for me then what you mean by flexible when it comes to the standards that, that all these folks are, are starting to work with? Yeah, so there's you know, different types of source, sources, whether it's media players, um, content servers, you know, high-end graphics workstations, um, video processor. Like, there's a ton of different types of sources, and there's quite a few different um, display standards for how you get that content to a wall or to a display. So we're always making sure we're always compliant with those standards and um, we stay up to date on, on what the latest ones are. All right, very good. Aran, same kind of question here. It, when it, the first one here, talking about deep media and um, making sure that the uh, content is dynamic, right? Uh, talk for a second about making sure that the, Iran, uh, making sure that the, the content is dynamic and, and making sure that the clients needs are being met even though we're it may, it may be being created by AI or by a machine. 
So the, the, the way we do is we start with like learning what the client's stories are, what they want to do. It's like a part of a, an immersion process or a discovery process. Once we know that, we, depending on how abstract or literal the story needs to be told, we then take stock of what David was mentioning, inventory what they have. So, so far we've been very much in tune with the design intent or the, the storytelling design intent throughout. We take that, we take stock of that, and then the main difference between this and classic way of compositing a movie that tells a story is that we create building blocks and, and you know, coding and algorithms that help assemble the story together in real life. And we also make, we think about it more than like a 10 second duration, we think about it over a longer period of time. So again, the story is being told with variations, with permutations. Um, you can, if, 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 again, if it, the story is very literal, we can go and start crafting mini stories, like campaigns, so to speak, right? Yeah. So the, the design intent on the client's intent is retained throughout the process. It's just almost the way we, the, the tools we use to tell the story are a little bit different, and they lend themselves to a more um, timeline-based story uh, approach, or a more, um, a longer view, if you might call it, for content to be assembled and reassembled and represented. Right. Michael, when you guys go into the same kind of, um, uh, content, whether that is a dynamic storyline or you're looking at one-offs or you're going down the road of machine learning and, and machine creation. What's your strategy when you're talking with the clients? See, I think, you know, our, our perspective when we approach these type of experiences is actually to um, start it not with the story of the content but with, with uh, thinking about the medium and defining and understanding that this is a uh, that we're inventing the medium, right? Yeah. Like this is not an existing medium that there's a trillion dollars of content for. And understanding um, the medium and the story um, together, like the medium and the experiential goals together then ends up being um, the content that we have to deliver. Um, and so, you know, I think when Sam was talking about like flexibility, uh, for us it's how can we um, have products that can be part of the architectural or the built space that don't um, play the role of a traditional display. Because really, when you have a traditional display on the wall in a built environment, you kind of, you have, I think you have two choices. You either ignore it or you leave the built environment and go into that window. And so if we're going to create dynamic spaces that um, support the activities that are happening in that space, we have to think about um, how the, that medium is a building block that is like brick or any other architectural material, but has a dynamism to it. Um, and so, um, you know, starting there, then we start to define, you know, whether this is a, a, a generative piece. And, and we tend to go generative because uh, the speeds of change with architectural materials are, are slow and they're based on change in the environment. You know, like the passing car creates a change in a shadow on a wall or where the sun is in the sky. And so using some of those same inspirations as uh, our data for how our dynamic spaces are changing algorithmically, I think matches a lot of the tempo or the, uh, the cadence of a, of a built environment much better than a traditional like linear cut media piece. Yeah. Real quick, before we move on, and uh, David's over here shaking his head at all of you. So <laughs> I, I want to get your thoughts on this. You, you, you mentioned the fact of, of the consideration between uh, completely removing and, and starting afresh with the building block or going into that window, I think is the phrase you used. What's the consideration between the two? I mean, is it, is it simply cost or is it, you know, the, the, that, that existing window, that existing installation really does fit that space? So why are we reinventing it? Let's utilize the, the, the window that's there. I mean, I think it's more about a, a decision of what the goal of that space is for. Like if you're in a, a presentation space and you want everybody in the audience to go into this window and no longer be aware of the other people, that's, it's great for that. Yeah. But if you're creating a space where there's other activity that's supposed to be happening there, then you don't want uh, people to, to leave that physical space okay. and, and go into there. So it's more of a behavioral or experiential goal-driven uh, decision than a uh, technology okay. driven decision. Or even cost. Yeah. Or right. cost. David, you, like I said, you were, you were agreeing with a lot of folks here, so. I, I was just, I was just uh, taking it back to your question about, about content, right? Because obviously, how do we deliver value? Well, first of all, this thing has to do a job, yeah. probably. And 
some of that is some kind of um, content, let's call it loosely, but when Michael correctly expands that, what we're really doing is, in some cases, we're creating behavior. We're giving a space of behavior. Okay. And sometimes that's really expressive, sometimes it's literal, sometimes it's video, um, but it doesn't have to be to be considered uh, a performant space. And um, so I think that's a, a, first a broadening of the definition of content is helpful. Very good. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and I just wanted to echo exactly what both David and Michael said is we do a hybrid of both because in AV and in life, right, it depends, <laughs> right? It depends on where your situ what your situation is. For example, in our, in our London office, we proactively decided not to put any public area displays on the floor where our team was working, which is the complete opposite of our New York office here in Midtown, right? There's six displays over everyone's desk all of the time, right? right? And those displays are, are, are showing either Bloomberg TV, right, self-plug, or, or arcade, or some type of metrics that the Bloomberg terminals feed in them. So it's not that those pieces weren't important in London, but they didn't want it to be a distraction. And to Michael's point is they wanted to create a space for that, a, a water cooler of sorts. So in each one of our Bloomberg spaces, we have pantries as well, where you get a snack and you sit and you talk and you eat and you collaborate and network. And so that's where we wanted to focus our largest digital signage piece, which tells a story, right? Because it's more than just advertising. It's telling a story. It's engaging and it's creating conversations that are then going to lead back to that workspace where everyone's collaborating. But at the same time, what we've decided is we still need that content. We still need the other pieces, like I said, the, the, what we call arcade, where it's the internal, hey, we have a, um, you know, Met Opera tickets, or you know, there's a picnic happening, you know, first come, first serve. So we still want those folks to have that opportunity to, to engage in that local um, community of Bloomberg, but you do it at your desktop level. So instead of having it splattered around the office floor, you log in and you engage now into that piece of content that you're looking for. So it's a channel on an IPTV lineup versus a public area display just flashing you at the time. And what's beautiful is the pantry area does allow you to have that you know, dual um, purpose where not only are you, you know, refreshing yourself, but you're also engaging in a piece of content that Bloomberg is, is telling you. Well, also you're, you're, you're creating an active uh, act, right, of engaging if you're, if you're having to log in as opposed to a passive act sometimes uh, of, a, of a display like that. Uh, James, I want to bring you in on this and, and it'll go back a little bit what, what Sam said about being flexible, right? When you go into a, a design and you go into, you get brought into a job, what are the, some of the considerations of going beyond even like, like Sam said, the, 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 the 16 9 f uh, space, right? And, and creating something that's, um, let's say, out of the ordinary, right? I mean, all of us up here and all of us in, on, in, in the audience here, we've lived with that 16 9 rectangle for 20 some odd years now, um, as we moved from S standard definition to, to, 10, or to 720 even. Um, how do you, as, as somebody who's kind of the glue that, 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 and the backing of these, these systems, look at that and go, okay, here, here's how we can do this, both creatively but also safely? Okay, um, when, as soon as you go outside the regular 169, I mean, when you're gonna put something into a building, especially if you're gonna go into uh, like into the window or into the walls, that kind of stuff. You're not just going to like stick something on the building. Uh, major concerns are basically isolating that display from the building's, basically the building's breadth. Like a building is going to move and, sh and shift, uh, change size, that kind of stuff in, in excess of the tolerance of most of modern display technologies. Um, getting that into a building safely and so that it doesn't actually get affected by those changes in temperature, humidity, seasonal changes, that kind of stuff. Um, that structure and that, that, that build and that design and getting it in safely is is, um, is something that has to start very early on in the in the process. Um, it needs to include the structural teams, uh, and architectural teams. Obviously, any of the creative people have to have their insight on what the aspect ratio would end up being and that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it's something that that uh, needs to be taken into account. I mean, a lot of times in in a lot of buildings now, especially in lobbies, the displays are the single largest. Um, you know, element within the building in terms of weight. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of concerns that way as well in terms of getting it structural, getting it sound, but I'll uh, make sure it's safe. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, you definitely would want a 60,000 pound sign falling over on someone. <laughs> that would be bad. It would be very bad. I, I wanted to add from the, from the visual or content perspective that when you talk about the 16 by 9, I think also referring to the traditional rectangle we've all been used to seeing on the wall. First of all, that rectangle can be very big and very immersive. Yeah. And 16 by 9 can also be 16 by 8 and a half or 16 by 7. <laughs> yeah. or, or 16 by 10. Just well, right. technically yeah. speaking, yeah. Once we start looking at architecture, at, at media as being part of the architecture and following uh, shapes and sizes that are not necessarily rigid rectangles, then we start creating more intrigue and we're creating different emotions in somebody's, you know, the immediate uh, uh, recognition of like, that's a display, it's going to give me information. It's, it's, it breaks up a little bit and you're able to now get, you know, connect and, or engage on a more emotional level. And from there you have more leverage, I'm going to say, to say, to tell a story or stories in that environment. Size is not always the most important thing, although we like shiny things and they're big, but sometimes I've seen beautiful installations from, them, from team members on this panel that were very restrained and refined and deliver an emotional uh, moment, but they were typically not the 16 by 9 aspect ratio and they did not look like a display. Yes. No. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I mean, the the concept of of resolution has definitely gone away. And in resolution, really, um, you know, speaking as you know, a past consultant, uh, um, uh, resolution is now more than one component. It's it's the carrier that gets it there. It's the tech, it's the density of the screen that actually creates the image itself, and it's the content player that either through ad channel or multiple channels puts that on the screen. Um, and that that can create a an almost a, for lack of a better term, think of like a, a carpet in, or, or a wallpaper. And then that technology becomes just the the what you see, but the pattern that gets put on it is the content itself. So you can pretty much put it anywhere, put like pixels anywhere on the on the building, and then you can map that and you can mix technologies as well. So you can put OLEDs with LEDs with with uh, LCDs and and create things that are. Uh, completely unique because of the way that they're actually mixed media in terms of the physical space as well. Sam, um, what's some of the things that we can do now from a technology standpoint that we couldn't do both from a consultant standpoint but also from a creative standpoint that we couldn't do maybe five or, five or seven years ago? Uh, I think um, you know, direct view LED, like this display behind me, has really changed the game. Um, it's seamless. So you don't have to forget about the bezels, which were, you know, for some situations you actually, the bezels are good because they help segment the content um, in a way that makes it easier to consume. But if you're trying to create an experience or an emotional um, connection with your, with your uh, customer, you have to make it, you're trying to fool the brain, right? You're trying to make it feel like it's real. And so having no bezels helps with that. They're also very bright. so. You know, you used to have to spend, and I, James knows a lot about this, about planning for lighting in a space. Um, like, if you're using a projector, like, you're lighting that space differently. And unfortunately, even if you've got a really bright projector, like, it's, it's a darker space. So your ability to, like, see each other's faces and have a shared experience is, is different. But with LED, you know, it's super bright. It's got a very wide color gamut. It just is able to mimic um, what you see in life just so much easier. So, and then I think, I don't know. I love the transparent OLED. It just for years we had, you know, transparent LCDs which just looked like a big microwave box and really what people wanted was a window that they could, you know, put content on and they didn't want to have a big box and they didn't want to have to stick their precious dinosaur bones in, in something that was going to potentially degrade them. Um, so when we first saw the the first version of the transparent OLED, it was about 5 years ago I saw it in a in a lab. Um, as a concept, and I get super excited about it because it's just, it, it's what we wanted, right? We wanted a, a window which you can put content on, so. Yeah, content on, and, and, and uh, the one here in, in, the, in the office here uh, is, it's, an, it's a Rolex uh, display, so there are three physical Rolexes behind it mm -hmm. with the content for Rolex playing yeah, in yeah. It, so yeah. Yeah, and I'm excited to see what's coming, too. I mean, yeah, there's been a lot of advances in the last few years, you know, like I said, fine pitch LED, now we're down to like 0 0.7, 0 0.6, which is incredibly pixel dense and expensive. Um, but you know, that wasn't possible five years ago. Fine pitch was like, you know, three millimeter or something. Yeah. But 
things are continuing to advance and there's been a lot of work. Um, some of you maybe follow the tech news, you'll see like how many patents have been filed on like micro LED. Like Apple just filed 135 or something yesterday, it's crazy. And those are tiny, tiny dense pixels that are gonna allow heads up displays. Um, we're gonna see a resurgence of like the Google Glass, I think, where they actually just look like glasses, but there are displays as well. And all that investment, for these super bright, tiny, tiny pixels is gonna enable finally the Star Trek or the, you know, the Star Wars, the holographic display is, it's coming. I've seen some very compelling prototypes. It's a few years out yet, but you guys as um, creators are gonna get so excited to be able to have a true holographic display because that's really gonna get into that immersive, um, connected experience with the content. Right. David, some of the questions is from a, a, a you know, laying it out and, and kind of quite casting a vision. What have you guys seen from your end that you can do today that you wish you could have done five years ago, but today it's like finally you're like, yeah, we, we, can, we can make this happen. I feel like the forces are kind of gathering to enable this kind of work and, you know, I've collaborated with so many folks on this, uh, on this uh, uh, panel for over a decade, right? And we've been, we've been doing this kind of work, it's just the barrier to entry was always harder. Um, we could always find some enterprising client who would uh, allow us to innovate on their behalf. Um, but it really now feels like everybody wants this work. They see how physical spaces can be expressive. They can talk to market-facing elements. They can talk to the community of a connected workplace. Um, and so, it stands to reason that whether it's marketing or brand or, or communications teams, they want their building spaces, their public, in, um, you know, their public spaces to to, to communicate, <clears throat> temporary as well as permanent. We mostly work in the permanent side, so I think um, the reason this panel is so aptly titled is because I think we're all saying seeing this appetite, and I think a lot of people are finding that they go into these conversations with clients, and even with all that appetite. Um, the project doesn't survive uh, and make it through design and into, into implementation. And so I think we all have an interest in saying, okay, well, if our clients are asking for this work and we have all the materials in hand to do, all, to do this kind of work, how do we bridge the gap between it came out, it was awesome, or it didn't happen? And I think that's a question is, is you know, when we work with, um, with, with Sam's folks on, hey, we want this thing that does this but not this, can you, and we have that kind of collaborative engineering relationship, mm -hmm. they're being creative as well. They're also helping us with guardrails. But you know, on the user side, I think someone like Abe needs to say, yes, we can't just fill these things with stuff we've made ourselves. We need to tell stories with data. How do we go about doing that? It's all these parts coming together. And I think from our part, what we've seen is today, I think with price points being what they are, with the appetite being what it is, with everybody essentially claiming this capability, what's the differentiator? You know, what's the differentiator in outcomes? And we're saying a lot of the time, somebody looks at this amazing display, this amazing canvas, this incredible installation that's been planned, and says, wait a second, how are we gonna feed the beast? And when they start to come to terms with how, what it would take to feed the beast in the way they know how, they can the project, and it's actually the best thing they could probably do, right? Um, and so if we can instead go and say, hey, the way you get ROI is by spending a little bit more up front when you have money to capitalize this thing, create a platform that's gonna make evergreen, deep media behavior over time, um, and then you don't have to, you know, see, you know, get memos every quarter about all the OPEX that's going into creating media for something. So it's, uh, I think it's the forces are gathering, the difference is I think we've all been doing this work. It's just becoming, um, there's a process, we've got ways of doing this work, we can educate clients, we can bring them along, um, but the crux is still, why would I make this seven, eight, nine figure investment? Real quickly, um, you said that you get to a certain point and then the projects don't happen. What's been the primary cause of the, or the, the reasoning for that? Is it the fact that they have, they, they suddenly realize they have to keep continuing to, as you say, feed the beast, or is it other factors? It could be so many things. I mean, ultimately, when we get involved, uh, you know, as early as possible with clients, they're almost at a strategy level. They're saying, hey, we feel like we need to, you know, employ this way of engaging with 
this audience or this audience or this community. Um, we want to do it in these places or with these touch points. So really, we're, we're coming up with a bunch of different I approaches, some of which may be very tech forward, and some where you're actually sort of sublimating the technology and using that to support a service element. So a lot of the times, the con the, these ideas don't make it out of the ideation stage because consultants are being responsible and saying, well, on balance, I think we should take those pixels out of the lobby and you should buy that piece of art or whatever it is. So I think there's good reasons for these things not to go through, but when they feel like the right answer to the KPIs, to the stra you know, stakeholders' priorities, um, oftentimes the thing that I think, you know, if we look at it responsibly and we say, hey, we need a content strategy here, this thing's on 24-7, that's 9,000 hours of content a year, have you thought that through? You should also have an answer. If you're, gonna pro you sh you're responsible if you provoke the question, and you're successful if you have an answer. Hey. Yeah, uh, some of the factors that kill projects is some of the folks on the team, be it in leadership or other levels, have ideas and they want their ideas to be, you know, come to fruition. But unfortunately, sometimes they haven't done the homework in order to really prepare for what that content is going to be and what that canvas is going to look like. So they'll have like, yeah, I want, you know, a mosaic of, you know, different LED panels scrolling through our lobby and, you know, it needs to be this color at this time and that color at this time. Um, but unfortunately, they don't really know what it takes to make that vision happen and that vision isn't really, like I said, developed. And so it's like they pre present this, this Ferrari that will only, you know, drive 55 miles an hour at the end of the day. And when they understand, wow, why am I paying Ferrari if this, we're only gonna do this with it? It becomes a, a, a cost exercise and it gets scrapped. And that's unfortunate because at the time that my team unfortunately is brought in, the, the AV team or the creative team is brought in, is they've already kind of had their idea of what they want it to look like and they just want us to mold their vision. And unfortunately, if we were brought in the beginning, we could absolutely obtain what they want and give them realistic numbers and really showcase the power of content and technology in their spaces. So that unfortunately does happen at times, not all the time. We are successful a lot in what we do, but when it does get killed or just dragged out, a lot of times because of those factors. One, one interesting aspect or experience that I'd like to share is that sometimes you build this jewel box or this interior that's engaging and immersive and then the clients either have an appetite but they, they just can't pass the budget to make more of them if they have multiple locations or they want to be able to scale something into a more modest representation but still carry the same spirit. And that's something that's getting more and more interesting because as David was mentioning, the appetite and the market, there seems to be like more readiness to accept this as a valuable proposition for any kind of storytelling in interiors. And sometimes people say, yes, but we can make only one of those. How can we make it in the other three smaller locations that we have around the world? And then one of the things is that do you start with the design of the story that can hold a more modest visualization? Or do you try to replicate and save on the fact that you've done one and you can build the other ones cheaper? Or is it altogether a different approach? So it's, it's a nice, interesting condition to be in where somebody says, we love this one, we need to make more of them. How can we make that a cost-effective scaling um, plan? It's, it's the next phase of after you've built the first one <laughs> the for the client. Yeah, Michael, I want to bring you in on this and the same kind of question is, is you know, walk me through getting, you know, from original ideation from the very beginning and then, you know, uh, to Abe's point where you've got several cooks, as it were, um, and they each have their own, own ideas. But then, you know, Ron made a really good point. You can have one, let's say, marquee, but then around the world, you can have various different, different flavors of that or size of it, I guess. Um. I guess uh, first of the the cooks question. Um, you know, I'd say I think we all have to be honest that this is it is still wild west to some extent, and um, and I say that from the not the technology side, but as much uh, in the both design and client side, right? Like our designers are just figuring out what LED is and how it works okay. in this space. Like our architects um, and our interior designers. And even our content designers, we've got some genius content designers, but their actual experience of working on large displays is still young, 
right? They're not, they haven't had 20 years of knowing how to create content for non-traditional displays. And then from the client side, they're not used to thinking about space as content, right? The, um, the people that traditionally think about space are the facilities or the operations people, like how many you know, butts can we get in the seats, not how are we telling our story in space. So I think that one of the reasons that a lot of um, projects get killed is because everybody's still new at this, right? Both on, on their side and our side, and um, there are uh, unrealistic expectations or just uh, you know, there's a lot of novice uh, experience, uh, novices in it um, because nobody's really done this. It's it's starting to be done, but we're we're just on that cusp of really activating the built environment. So are you saying we're uh, all novices then? I, I'd say we are all not. I mean, really, well, realistically, that's a, that's a fine no. Answer. But I, I really do think we are all novices at activating the built environment with non-traditional displays. It just the technology hasn't been around enough for us to have done. Uh, you know, 20 years of oh. these types of sophisticated projects. Yeah. Um, I, we're doing great work. I think there's fantastic examples out there. Um, but, you know, I spend a lot of my time figuring out how I can grow my team's expertise in how to work with this. Um, because it's, it's new to them. Even if they're amazing designers that have been around for many decades, it's, this is a new world. Um, so. That's, uh, I, that's like the cooks in the kitchen. It's how do you manage a bunch of novice cooks in the kitchen? <laughs> um, and then uh, as far as uh, leveraging network or multiple um, locations, I mean, one thing that I've found is really interesting and I think helps save projects um, is if you think about them as, a, as an ecosystem, not as a, a one-off or a marquee moment or this iconic moment. Because yes, the iconic moment is important, and a lot of what we do are these big, cool, marquee moments, and you put a lot of money into that, but I think you really leverage that value when it's part of a larger ecosystem. So, you know, similar, I think, at Bloomberg, where you use that center space to to give that message or give a sense of identity, but then that repeats itself uh, through all multiple channels throughout the whole campus. Um, that's where the value really comes in. Everybody knows that they are in this space. Uh, the marquee moment announced it, and now it's it's uh, you know continued that story on all of your different touch points throughout the space. Yeah. I just want to uh, comment on your uh, your about the novices. Um, I, I work with all the consultants and creators across North America, and it is fascinating to see how each one of the teams is actually leveraging the technology. Um, it's really neat for me because I get to see how everyone approaches it differently, and there's no there is no right way. There's there's a couple not so good ways, but um, but. The, the technology itself is actually, in, the, in terms of flexibility, um, it can really be painted and put almost anywhere into a building. Uh, it can be made different shapes, it can be curved, it can, uh, you can do all kinds of different things with it. Uh, you can move it, and like there's, there's, there's different things you can do, and uh, it, it's just really, I, I do agree that there are a lot of people who are, are novices at it, and, and it's, an, it's, it's unique for me because I get exposed to it on like a 100 fold level uh, because the, everyone's like, well, how about this and about that, about this and about that, because um, you know, my role is, is to, to, to help with, with uh, the consultants in terms of actually figuring out, okay, what pixel pitch do they need and that kind of stuff and give them the distances and the brightness and that kind of stuff within the environment and run that, I'll run that initial math with them and just be, basically be like an assist. Um, and I agree, it's, 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 a, novice, it's a novice enterprise. Um, but I think it's exciting at the same time because it is a novice exercise and there's no guaranteed way to have to use it. So you can really, it, it's, it's, it's kind of neat because it is the Wild West. I, that's a great comment and way to put it. Yes. And that's, that's where innovation comes from, right? Innovation yeah. comes from us all trying to figure it out. And that's why it is so exciting and why there's great stuff coming from it. But it's also yeah. why it's, it, it's a challenge. <laughs> it is a very big challenge for sure. I'll ground us in the term pioneering. Pioneering. Pioneers. Pioneers. <laughs> novices, novices becomes pioneers. There All you right. go. <laughs> Sam, let's kind of wrap this around and what we started talking about in the beginning here, and that's the digital canvas, right? Um, we, we talked about getting beyond the, the rectangle. That's what it was, 16.9, 16.8, 16.10, I don't care, right? Or 2.44 if you want to get into cinema, right? Um, 
what from from the the manufacturer's standpoint and and creative you got you got you are on the cutting edge here when you talk about the digital canvas are you talking about that shape there or is it more ethereal is it more of an idea rather than there's a solid piece of, of shape there I, I think for me personally it, it is more ethereal it's it's kind of um, like James was saying it, it's 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 um, it's like carpet or wallpaper almost um, but I have to ground myself and remember that some people are not as pioneering as others and it's very confusing and so um, and now I'll do a little product plug which I don't normally do I'm not a salesperson but we've one thing we found with LED because it can be any resolution in any size people get a little overwhelmed by the idea of it and then they buy a wall that fits a physical space and they don't have content that can fit and it can be challenging so we made these like pre-made configurations of like it's basically like an LED wall in a box it's this HD and this pitch it's 4k and this pitch and it's one part number one price you buy it you get everything you need and you're done um, and I think there's a place for that I, yeah. I, I, I do because um, you know like we've all been exploring um, you know like Michael was saying you know that some of these content uh, creators just aren't ready to be in that headspace of digital wallpaper um, and sometimes you just want like you just want a presentation wall you know so I think that's that's fine so we try to enable like sort of both levels of like wild out there whatever right. and then like just make it easy if you just want to you know a box a screen and the fact that in LED, the RGB LED, the building blocks have gone smaller, right? They're a lot smaller, gives us more flexibility. Yeah. So you're using a productized version, but you're creating something that's a lot more bespoke, or at least bespoke looking. Right. James, like, James, when you when you start talking with folks about digital canvases and, and you know, what sort of things do you start walking down with them, uh, regardless of whether it's the actual physical mount? Obviously, for you guys, it's also the building structure and the, the substructure, the, the, the spaces behind it, the things you're actually anchoring to. But also, some of it, is, how it has to be you know, how they're using it and exactly what the experience of the person consuming that has to be. Yeah, the, there, there's two different aspects to uh, putting a building into the wall from a, a person aspect. Um, one is the viewer side of it. The other one is actually the service side of it. Okay. Um, I would say that we actually spend a fair amount of our time actually figuring out how to actually service different aspects of it, whether it's getting at cabling in behind, uh, moving stuff out of the way. Um, there is no standard in the industry in terms of it has to be done a certain way, which is great because there's always something flexible and you can do it use even within within planar's line. You have uh, you know you have TDF, you have DLX, you have TWA. You know, there's all kinds of different products that you can use. Um, each one has its own aspects of how you manage that and what the image it creates with. Um, so what they're trying to do in terms of the use case and what the architecture has within it really has to marriage together. And it's being able to take a look at both parts of that and basically going, okay, well, I know, you know there, here's something you could do and here's something you could do. And, and just kind of giving almost like a heads up to the, to the design team. It's like, well, you know, on what, what would be possible and what's not possible. Um, and it's a very malleable environment um, in terms of that. It's, it's recognizing the gotchas that are really the key things, I think, nowadays. It's, uh, you, you can get 99% of it, and that 1%, well, it's, it, could be the end, it could end up being the 99% <laughs> yeah. in the end uh, on how to get it into a building. So, David, same kind of question when you're designing and you're talking to, to clients, you know, and they're going down this path. Uh, either it's you, because of something you suggested or they're bringing it to you because they've read something, seen something, gone to a friend's office and what have you. What are some of those gotchas? What are some of those hurdles you're making sure to navigate them around to make sure that, you know what, this is going to be a great experience for everybody going, going from end to end? And this really piggybacks on to what Michael was saying about how innovation comes from a curiosity or a novice state of mind, <clears throat> um, as well as what are the I mean, we're, we're putting technology for a three, five, in some cases, seven year life cycle into a built environment <clears throat> and we're trying to give it this software defined behavior, right? So that's a complicated series of, of questions. So I think the first thing is the cooks in the kitchen, it's actually a team sport. This is not a traditional process. You don't call your architect and ask them to build a storytelling environment unless you call, you know, certain architects. And, um, <laughs> And you don't call your agency and ask them to design a building, 
So there's this, there's this function that needs to stitch together the, the, you know, oftentimes when you walk into a C-suite, the CMO and the chief of operations are actually at loggerheads. They want this thing. CMO's got some OPEX to buy commercials with. COO's been told that we're gonna make this thing in the lobby and, um, and you've gotta budget it out. And so I think just getting alignment from stakeholders who have been effectively led to believe that their uh, interests are in opposition with each other. And so you stitch them together and then you bring in a bunch of people and that includes um, you know, technical resources who are gonna do pre-engineering, even manufacturers, I mean, the number of times that we go and reach out to Randy and say, hey, RPV, we think that this is gonna be something where we're gonna need your level yeah. of, uh, of, of attention to detail and fabrication know-how. So let's just start having this conversation now. What would be the gotchas? What are the things that we need to consider? So I think it's, it's the way to guard against the pitfalls is by recognizing that this is a team sport, and that's true on the client side, and on the design and implementation side, and showing the client that this ecosystem, the way you get this work done, is with a different set of resources that they're typically used to having to pull together, and that while we're novices and curious, and we're always we're being asked to be novices because they say, hey, come give me, come do something new. So it's yeah. like, okay, what, and then they say, what should we do? And I said, I have no idea. You just said, let's do something new. So I'm gonna listen let's to find you out together. It, right? Let's find out together. So, but that can scare them. And so you have to be able to say, look, it's not just a free for all. It's not, we're not having everybody jump in the pool at the beginning of the party, but we have to have a way to say here, look, there's a process, we've done this before. We start by looking at your spaces and being curious about what they're there for and how they feel. We start to look at your audiences and who's in the space and how might we connect with them. We start to hear from the storytellers in your organization and what is it that they're desperate to, to convey. Uh, is it an emotion? Is it a piece of information? Is it a we're winning in the market today? We don't know, right? And those three things then have, have process. So you can sort of say, listen, you're trying, to, you're trying to have us do something new, but we have an innovation process. There's a different kind of risk that you're getting into here, so you need a different kind of risk management of that innovation, and, and it's by having a team that um, stitches together architecture, construction, storytelling, digital strategy, software, display technology. I mean, it it's really is a team sport, and it's not led through the typical process. Mm -hmm. Michael, and, uh, yeah, I just wanted to jump in. One of the things that I found really, um, uh, really encouraging lately is the amount of focus I've seen in the AV community in uh, a concept called design thinking. Which, if you're a creative, like yep. you learn it in school, and it's just, it's a thing. But it's not something that you traditionally would learn if you go to, like, if you have an engineering degree or a mechanical engineering degree or an electrical engineering degree. Um, it, it, but it's becoming more and more like even just like for regular business people, like this is a way to solve business problems is to mm. use this design thinking approach. Um, and it just makes that getting everybody together and going through these ideation um, scenarios, just it, it just, it works in a way that it, that it didn't before. So I'm really encouraged to see the amount of investment there's been. And I, I see, you know, some people nodding, like it's, it's, it was surprised me at the beginning. because I was like, design thinking? I don't really think about that for AV, but it really fits, so. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Michael, uh, we, we, um, David was talking about the team sport. How do you get your teams, whether it's your teams or Abe's teams, um, together on the same page in this new environment? Because yes, it, we, we, we've said this several times, we're pioneers, we're novices, how you want to say it. It's a new environment, it's a new creative process, and creating content for it, whether it's 24 7, so you know, 9,000 some odd hours, or it's, you know, eight hours a day. This is a new way to think when it comes to the content. How do you get everybody on board and their head wrapped around it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I would build on both what Sam was saying with design thinking and, and David's uh, risk and process. Um, and it, it, it is really about how do you not see it for the first time when you get on site, right? Like you can't innovate anything effectively if the first time you've seen it is when it's done. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've, Actually, Gensler's invested significantly in uh, creating a space that we can iteratively design uh, and bring uh, real technologies into our space. Um, and 
I'd say that for a team sport, um, we, we become a team both in thinking about risk, so we have like moments of risk assessment where we each come with our expertise and say, you know what, I don't think that story is gonna work, or I don't think, I think that's gonna get too hot. How are we gonna ventilate it? Or, um, you know, I don't think anybody's gonna jump up and down as their interaction with it. And so everybody throws their, um, their risks on the table, and then we make plans to figure out you know, which of these risks are gonna kill the project, so we have to prove that they're gonna work. Um, which of them can we move to the next phase of design to prove out then? Uh, but it's a very iterative, where are we now? What are the risks? How do we do a mock-up to prove out those risks so we can move to the next, uh, through that gate into the next phase of design? And I, hey, and I think I, I wanted to maybe even abstract it a little bit because I think David, said, David and Michael both said uh, very strong positions about the team sport. The, the, the rapid iteration is means that multiple entities like the physical designers or interior designers, the technology people, the storytelling people, experience design people, software environment people, all these people are actually working almost in lockstep throughout all the phases of the project. There's no real big handoff where like in a traditional design effort, somebody's programming and then somebody's executing or some programming and designing. It's um, a lot more of a rapid iterative approach across multiple teams, some of them not even in the same firm, just working together as each one is its own responsibility. We used to be handed off interior spaces from architects saying, there's a digital moment going over there. David's point is like, we explore the space, we see what's curiosity involves around it. At that point, we already involve the architect in this strategic process thinking. So the team sport is a super valid uh, thing, and it just means that we have to work almost like in lockstep and rapidly iterate as opposed to like, we do do the SDDD CD, but we do it in a lot more rapid iterations inside it, multiple cycles. Yeah. If, if I can yeah. just piggyback on that, I would say it's a hybrid, right? So um, that rapid iterative, let's call it agile kind of workflow that's powered by design thinking is really great to solve certain kinds of problems. It's not how we build buildings. And at the end of the day, we're talking about work that occurs in the physical, in the built environment. And so um, going back to the parts of, you know, there's a 2,000 year pretty much unchanged architectural process that is unchanged for a good reason. It's great at, at defining and managing the risk of building spaces. And that waterfall process that governs that kind of, is the best way to manage the risk of construction. And, and yet we know that software and design and innovation happen in this more iterative way. So I think part of, this, the, the, part of you know, the emerging best practices, and I think we talk about it in our practice, I know you guys do, is how do we effectively introduce the client to a way of working that synthesizes or at least har lets them live harmoniously um, an iterative, um, uh, you know, sprint-based uh, approach to design and software questions um, while allowing, but while being responsible to the physical and technical design and, and the way that the, the, the critical path flows through that side. So it's not either or, you know, um, it's not either or. Yeah, I was gonna say to the, uh, the realistic uh, piece of that as well is, Designers design, that's what we do, right? We have ideas and concepts and we put them on paper. And we hand those papers and those PDFs over to clients and, and hopefully you know, they can ingest what they're looking at and, and, and visualize what it is that they're designing. Bloomberg, at its core, is a data company, but also a technology company that provides 